Hello, and welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. It's my podcast. I'm so thankful that you've joined us, and I'm really happy to bring to you one of my favorite racers in all the garage area and listen to Kurt Busch and his stories about showing up in NASCAR in the early 2000s, winning a championship, then leaving Penske Racing to go out and figure out who he was. It's going to be so cool to listen to Kurt's stories. Emotional, very well thought out. His plan, what is that plan and how does it work? Can't wait to listen to him share those details with us. So listen to this also. What you got to do is go to the official Fox Sports YouTube channel and watch us. You can see full video of Waltrip Unfiltered, the podcast. You can also tell your friends, since I see you're watching, you can tell your friends that they can go to their favorite podcast app and add Waltrip Unfiltered. They can also give us a rating, uh, give us a five-star rating about the content and what you're going to see. And I know I'll get a five-star today because you're going to love getting to know Kurt Busch. Hey, Spazzle, be ready. Green flag, green flag. All clear, buddy, all clear. Man, thanks for coming by. This is awesome. Yeah, this is fun. I have no idea with the podcast and everything that's going on. And then everybody at Fox here is like, oh, my gosh, we should have put you to work all day long. It's like, no, I came in for Mikey. I came well, in for the podcast. Yeah, the, the podcast is something that we've done this year, and it's been so cool. We're buddies, so I'm, I know a lot about you, and it's interesting, our friendship over the years. But when you have guys like Christopher Bell and Justin Haley, some of these kids, even Corey LaJoy and Matt DiMenedetto, you just you get to know them and learn so much about them, and it's just a great chance for me to, to appreciate even more people's struggles, their challenges, and what all they went through to get to the Cup Series. No, I, I agree with you 100%. When you have a, a nice setting where you can talk and not have a timeline, the, the kids and their stories are the same as ours Yeah. on how you have to work your way up and get beat down and then come back up again. And <laughs> and then you said Matt DiBettadetto? Yeah. I don't know if I've ever said his last name right, so thank you. Yeah, you, you, just, you have to – I learned this on TV. You have to slow it down. So, because you want to be like Di Benedetto, but it's Di Benedetto. Di Benedetto yeah. with another top five. That's this right. Weekend. Was that impressive or what? Speaking of this weekend, uh, what a what a struggle it was or a challenge it was. I watched the race closely, and uh, I look at one of your tweets here. You said, uh, <laughs> "Let's go to the Bible here." <laughs> <laughs> this must be the truth. Social. I read it on the internet. Well, it came from my social. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it says, uh, "Unraveled like a ball of yarn at the end." Disappointed to run like we didn't not have that great of a finish i paraphrase um because i don't have my glasses on i get it i saw you up front how do, how does tell the fans how does one fall apart on you like that yeah it was uh, unraveling like a ball of yarn that is a very polite way to shorten it up with all the four letter words yes. that were going across the radio i um <clears throat> i was given the opportunity to to pit or not to pit i don't like that when I'm in the car and we're at the end of the race, if we're going to pit, tell me. If we're staying out, tell me. And so Matt McCall and I had to go through another speed bump or a learning curve. And he goes, hey, we're running sixth. If you think you can restart on the outside lane, stay out. All right. So now I'm counting cars ahead of me. And what's the spotter doing? That's kind of his, he's a counter too, right? Yes. And we're all together on it. And right at the last second, Eric Jones is coming in. Yes. And he peels back out and I was wanting to stay out, but he crosses over the orange box. I somehow miss this, this voodoo orange box. I guess the orange box is if you commit to pit road, you can't touch the orange box. But if you bail out and cross back over the orange box, now you're back out on track and it's okay. It's that, not a penalty. I just want to tell you, that's weird. Dude, I'm like, I, I texted Steve O'Donnell. I said, I understand the call you guys made, but that orange box, it's it's voodoo. We, we got to simplify it. So I pit because I was counting cars in front of me. And then we made the wrong car adjustment. <laughs> and then I smacked the right rear on the fence. And then I went from about 6th to 18th. Mm -hmm. So call it a 12-point loss. Now that's, that's yarn unraveling. Yeah, we do radio <laughs> sweetheart here on Wednesday. Any any chance Kurt will make an appearance? It's normal, normal for me. So yeah. it, like, if it was extreme, then yeah, maybe. But right. No, this was just straight up four letter words, not directed at anybody, and it was all driver. 
I'm the one that had the steering wheel. I could have chose to stay out. I could have kept the car off the fence, but I didn't. And that sounds like a driver on Monday. Are we allowed to cuss on this? Yeah. Too? Oh, okay. Yeah. It happens. That's that's <laughs> basically what went down. And the best shit that happened to me, and the most energetic I think I've seen you in forever. Well, maybe not forever. You're you're, you're a cool dude. Was Kentucky. When you, you were able to, to celebrate that victory, and, and you used a four-letter word there that, that just summed it all up. Hell yeah, yeah to those fans. What's, how, I've got so many questions, one of which I, I get, we ask our fans. Uh, of Kentucky's the pod- your home state. It is. Okay. And, and what a crazy great race it was. Um, no, I wanted to give a shout-out to the fans when I was interviewed by NBC, right, at the start-finish line. I didn't know that it tuned into the loudspeakers for all the fans. So literally, there's 70,000 people listening in to that interview. And I just went, hell yeah. Like, Woo, Kentucky. And did you hear them? Yeah. They came oh, alive, yeah. right? It's like I felt like I was Steven Tyler at a concert. <laughs> like, yeah, we love you, Kentucky. <laughs> and, and everybody's going nuts. And, and that was the emotions of, of winning and feeling it all. And then the crew guys are going bananas. You know, I did the stage dive with them. And you got to ride them to Victory Lane. That looked like old school. I thought that was David Pearson when he was driving to Victory Lane in Daytona that year. It was it was perfect. I, they planned it. I didn't know what was going down. They just start piling on the car. And one guy, he's got his right foot wrapped around my left leg. Like, it's it's getting intimate, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's an interesting victory celebration. I bet you never saw that coming. Gets worse. Gets worse. Uh-oh. I had to reach underneath his leg to kind of get to the switches to fire the car back up. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, okay. Right. Any brush? Anything weird? It's, it's okay. We're winners. Yeah. We're right. winners. You are winners. And uh, Kentucky was awesome. We, C- we needed that. CJ, read me that tweet I like. And uh, first off, third, Kurt, thank you for uh, being here with us. We asked fans to send in Twitter questions for us, for both of you, with hashtag AskMikey. And the first one we liked that came in was from Chase Williams, Chase underscore W-I-L-72. He wants to know, what's your most memorable race so far in your career, all time? What's your most favorite that you think about? And then I know oh, wow. it, the, the we usually say we need top three Kurt, the top three Kurt Bush moments of, of your career. Uh, think about those. But let's start with, with this one. I know the one that you just had in Kentucky had to be special. You talked about the celebration, the crew. Was it the best? Gosh, it, you can't put the word best. It's like kids, right? Attached to a win. Everyone is special. <laughs> <laughs> it's like kids. Yeah, I don't have kids yet, but I know what you're saying, Mike. Ian, when you win, there's so much that runs through your mind right away. And the first thing now being older is appreciating the team and the teamwork. Uh, when I was younger, it was like, yeah, I did this all on my own. Yeah. You know, I was like, pit stops, bitch stops. You know, I, I outdrove these guys. And then with the sponsorship side of things and the manufacturer, everything starts kicking in. And I don't know, all, all wins have their significance for different reasons yeah. at this point. And would I put Kentucky in a top five category? I would. Yes. It's helped me. Now, I'm not saying it was bad. When I lost to Ricky Craven in the closest finish in NASCAR history at Darlington in 2003, Ricky beat me by 0-0-2. And I knew that was something special, like the feeling of that battle and how the finish ended up. And yet I was second. It wasn't a win. This one at Kentucky, 2019, I beat my little brother in a brother battle. Mono e mono, like who's gonna lift going through turns three and four, and to come out on top of a, a special finish like that. So I get to go to Victory Lane and do all that stuff, and now you're thinking of all the video reels that are gonna show forever. And it's like it kicks in. Yeah, I won this one. That win almost now trumps the Darlington one of 2003. Uh, memories. Yeah, and, and yeah. the value of it. Right. And now if I beat Kyle Larson. It could be a little bit of a different feel or, you know, Harvick or Truex or Logano. But beating my little brother, that puts it up there. Yeah, the Daytona 500, the photos from that victory lane and and just so many memories that you've had. Uh, People ask me what my favorite win is. And, you know, it's it would be obvious to say one of the Daytona 500s, but. I have so many mixed emotions about what happened in Daytona. The, the first one, obviously, losing our friend Dale 
And the second one, I had the dominant car, but it rained. And, you know, so I don't have any pictures of taking the checkered flag. I was sitting on my pit box when they said I won. And, and, uh, I remember that one though. That one was. Why, why do you remember it so well? Yeah, I, I was second that day, and I'm like, <laughs> it isn't even raining outside. There's no lightning bolts. Come on, let's go back racing again. Yeah, <laughs> I was the opposite. I I'm like, okay, I've been dominant, and I'm I'm winning. It can rain, and I'm fine with that because you, you know I I done my job to that point. But isn't that great? Like this emotion of the guy leading. This emotion of the guy's second. Well, yeah. I want to compare that to something for you. I didn't even think about this until I uh, started doing some research for our chat. In 08 at Loudon, You did research? Yeah, look. Way to go. Bro. Look at all this paperwork this is, I've got. Fabulous. I, I noticed, too, when I did my research, you've, you've, you've done some really cool things. But back to Loudon, <laughs> 2008, the, the rains came in late, and you were leading, and I was second. And when, that, when they call that race, I'm like, damn, I've never thought one time about what Kurt Busch thought in 2003 – when they called that race. You sparked back to that moment? <laughs> I did. I'm like, I, I never cared about Kurt's feelings that day. But but now I think I'm experiencing everything he felt. You know, I, I want to race more. I want to go beat that guy. Isn't that amazing? Like, I'm like, oh, it's raining. Yeah. It's like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> geez, we should call this. It, and now I'm jumping into what you were feeling to win. It It's so unique, right? And so many different emotions. And yet it's being in position. To win. Yeah. That's what I always tell crew chiefs that I'm with or team members. It doesn't matter if it's a, a gamble on fuel or, you know, to stay out on a, on a late caution. Yes, fast race cars usually work their way to the top, but it's still about just putting yourself in position to win no matter what. Yeah, I had a uh, another one-two finish with you was Phoenix in 05, and, and I had – uh, oh, I remember that one. Yeah. Dude, you ran like lane five. There you wasn't a lane the where I was. <laughs> you were up on the wall in three and four that year. What happened is Dale Jr. had had so much success with Tony Uri Jr. at that track. And I qualified 30th. And I was distraught. I'm like, that. I, I'm, I'm terrible. I can't get this. It drives me. Hell with it. I'm just going to wing it. And then I started that race and I said, I have to win. I have to win for Tony Jr. You know how... Race car drivers are crazy in their brain. Mine was, I don't care what it takes. And for some reason, I was able to drive to the front and lead. And there you were. And and we were matched. Like, I couldn't. It was just man for man. So close, but I couldn't get there. And I, I just love that memory of how hard we raced that night. We raced hard. I, I pitted because Fenning thought tires were good for our fast car. But, again, it gets down to track position mm-hmm. at the end. And. Every, why do drivers – I don't get this. How do we all magically just pick up lap time Yeah. at the end of the races? It's it's brain, It's your mind, it I think. It is so weird. Like the pace can be 30 seconds flat, and then at the end everybody's running 29 fives. It's yeah. Like, Where did all this speed come from? <laughs> I, I get confused by it. That was a good battle because I remember you were in this weird groove. I'm like, what's he doing up there? I'm, I'm not going to go up there and try that. i got to stick with the bottom. i got to stick with what I know. And it was really a, a cool battle because Phoenix never really has those lane options. Yeah, and still doesn't really. But it's, <laughs> it's, I, I want to talk about uh, finish up about Kentucky. T- take us to um, behind the wheel, coming to the the green flag. You're setting on row two. If you can, if you can take yeah, a row minute. three. Yeah, no row two. Yep, row two. But but take take me through uh, one to go. They throw one to go. Your brain and, and, and everything that you're sizing up, what you see, and then conversely, how what you saw or predicted, how did that all work out? All right, if I could drop it back a few laps before that. Yes, please. We're running fourth, which I didn't know we were fourth at the time. We came out on the green flag stops like an eighth, and I'm, I'm just jamming, passing cars, just going as hard as I can. And they said that the 20 was up ahead, and... The 18, the 22, I'm like, okay, all right, I think I'm around fourth. Man, if I could just get a yellow. <laughs> Literally, the lap before, I said that in my mind. It never comes either, by the way. It did. And then it did. It did, because the week before, that damn lightning bolt, when I was leading the race, didn't show up at the right time. So I literally asked for something to happen. It did. Something in return, maybe? It, it happened, yes. It was, I was thankful for the yellow. Uh, you know, it was just one of those freak things with Bubba Wallace got a flat tire mm-hmm. and spun around. And 
he says, I owe him a beer, by the way, but I don't know if he really had anything to do with that. But I'll go get the beer from Bubba later. But I wasn't thinking that in the car. All right, so to your question, fourth with a green-white checker. Here we go. I look in the mirror. Spotter said it right at the same time. He says, 42 is behind you, and he's going to roll with you. Now, that had to be great, right? Well, I'm like, wait a minute. He didn't roll with me earlier this year. He blitzed (laughs) me like three, four wide at Charlotte earlier this year at the All-Star race when he won. Yes. That's the first thing that went through my mind. And then I said, you know what, Self? If he said it, he's going to go with you. So I trusted him. But don't you wonder sometimes if the spotter just says it or do you think that it, that it was said, I'm going with you? I, I didn't second guess it. Uh, I did not the, if he wouldn't have, now I'm going to have to second guess it in the future. So Larson's going to roll with me. That means I don't have to look in the mirror. I have no reason to look backwards. Nice. So Kyle's on the inside. Logano's on the outside. Then you got Eric Jones who's a teammate with my little brother. I'm like, man, those two are going to probably hook up and go. But if I've got Larson behind me, I'm going to dispose of this 22 Logano as quick as I can. And so with the restart, we, we're going up through the gears. Logano tried to jump like he did at Michigan, where he went before the zone. Tried to do it again. But they didn't do anything to him, did Little they? brother was on him. So Kyle <laughs> held him up from the left side. I had Larson pushing me from the back, and I was able to get around the 22 pretty clean. And down the back straightaway, turn you know, with, with Larson behind me. I didn't look in the mirror again, but now we're down back straightaway. It's me and the 18. And we drove down into turn three, and I'm just staring at his door. Like, I'm not lifting because I got to stay on him for the side draft. Yeah. And we drove all the way, and we had to kind of crack the throttle before the turn four wall. And so we we both kind of checked each other up off of four. But then I got the side draft. Man, I wanted to be clear, but I didn't quite get clear going into turn one. And he actually rubbed our left rear fender. Now I smell smoke inside the car. I'm like, oh, come on. Well, wait a minute. It's only a mile to go. Maybe the tire will hold out. (laughs) Down into turn one, we're wide open, and this this corner's easier at Kentucky now to hold it wide open. And I have to stay side drafting on his on his right rear, side drafting, pulling ahead. Now he's on my left rear. I knew he'd be there. I knew I wouldn't have enough momentum to clear him. Same thing into turn three. Uh-huh. Just stared at his door to make sure I stayed on him to side draft him. And my backup plan, if Casey chopped me, was to just drive straight through him. Right. We both would have wrecked. We both would have been in the grass. It would have been the old fight. But but you're telling brothers. you're telling all the things in your brain that was an option. That if was he, option B. Yeah. Option A. He's gonna give me room. I know he's gonna give me room, and I'm gonna time it just right, and I'm gonna come off of four with the momentum, and have just enough back at the line to beat him. Yeah. That was plan A, and it worked out. It was beautiful too to watch. That track just had such great racing. And I have, let me tell you real quick, uh, side side star, story. I don't use the P word, ever. Package. Package. You, y'all aren't racing packages. You're racing cars. Our cars, yeah. And it just drives me crazy. All the talk. Another thing that drives me crazy. I don't like it when it's called VHT or PJ1. I like traction compound because that's what it is. And yep. if you're a novice viewer and you turn on, they're talking PJ1, VHT. I'm like, what are the traction compound that they laid down in a corner? That's I get smart. that. I like that. But I digress. Um, talking <laughs> talking about the package, like, don't do that. Y'all are racing cars. And by the way, the races on Sunday, the cup races, like, I'm a fan now. I'm not doing, you know, the, the Fox broadcast. I'm just sitting at home or at the track watching you guys. I'm finding the ones on Sunday way more entertaining than the ones on Saturday. I like what I'm seeing on Sunday afternoon with the with the rules and the 2019 yeah, cars. The draft is much more insane and more intense. That's what I was getting and to. More strategic. How did how did you? What if that we hear about wake and you can't pass in that wake? How did you? How were you able to keep that nose right on your brother? With all that wake off turn two when you were heading down down to turn three, and what made you think that it wasn't just going to go? If it it just washed out on me, it washed out because I was too aggressive. I didn't care on that side of it. But the track, nighttime, the last run, and the grip level in the tires, it's as if the two cars up in front have the clean air. As soon as you're third, 
So, like, we're side by side. I think it's clean air on both. Mm -hmm. Third, he's he's sturdy air, and the thing's just sliding all around. So I felt like if I could hold it to the outside, I could stay that close to wide open, and it worked out. How many of those guys on that team that you took to victory lane were going there for the first time in in their role? I know that was Matt McCall's first crew chief. And, by the way, don't we have a crew chief Twitter question? Um, You have driven to the one about – Nine different crew chiefs. Yeah, the, quanti- the quantity of crew chiefs. <laughs> so, Is that a good thing, Mike? You're bad. I, you know, it's understandable. We've, <laughs> we've been a little volatile through the years, what? maybe. I just want to win. Yeah. Uh, do you? Can you name all nine of them and, and talk about how many of them you got their first win for? So the, the amount of crew guys, I want to say, is at least 25 guys uh, that were in victory lane for their first time. Yeah. And then back at the shop, I need to get another body count of guys yeah. it, it was that many years for for the one car and also just that many new guys that yeah. were part of it and that's the most gratifying and satisfying part of taking a new team to victory lane is all the new emotions for everybody and you know i pop their cherry yeah, yeah they're always going to remember that first win right went to victory lane with kurt bush and what how was it for Matt? I mean, from talk you talked about the thunderstorm and the lightning bolt and the call at Daytona and, and the frustration and the emotion. One week later, he he he's redeemed. But yet we were also on like an alternative strategy. <laughs> it ended up working out. <coughs> oh, it wasn't a plan in our favor with the yellow at the end. But it, uh, that's again, you got to put yourself in position for it. And Matt was great. He handled it like a champ. I mean, his, his wife was sending out tweets on, don't pit, don't pit, yeah. don't pit, Daytona. And Did you see him on Twitter with this, did this the past mean week? tweets yeah, and all the answers? The, yeah. And that's how, that emotion and that little bit of extra energy that we took to Kentucky, uh, it was a chip on our shoulder. Uh, yeah, we, we should have a win. But yet the Kentucky package was so similar to what we ran at Michigan a few weeks before that, and we finished second. It was – Really, really close. And so it just it, – everything was lining up for the right reasons. And McCall is a good dude. You know, yeah. he doesn't get rattled very easy. And yet we still have to make mistakes to learn, and we're trying to do that at the right rate and, and still produce the results. And we've had a very good, consistent year. And so I'm happy for Matt and all of our crew guys and the question of crew chiefs and all nine um, – I missed one the other day. They did ask me, and it was uh, Johnny Klossmeyer was my lead engineer uh-huh. who filled in for Tony Gibson ah. at Pocono in 2016. Uh, but with the first win way back with Jimmy Fenning mm-hmm. at Roush Racing, Jimmy taught me the most. Jimmy Fenning taught me the most about how to race, when to race, when it's important to go hard and when it's not. And he he made me the the champion that I am. Jim nice. Fenning was the best. And, yeah, you know everybody's been great though over the years. I won a race with Roy McCauley uh, right away at Penske. Uh, Pat Trison came over and we ran really good in '07 together before the the car tomorrow. Um, and we were there winning in '09 together. Then Steve Addington mm-hmm. came on board. So what, what are we up to? One, two, three, four. Uh, Addington and I ran really good on Atlanta and the mile and a half for a few years. We won Sonoma and Dover together. Um, and then uh, I didn't win at Phoenix Racing. We were close to winning Sonoma uh, with Nick Harrison, which, you know, rest in peace, Nick. We can talk about him in a little bit. I, I'm going to miss Nick. Uh, with Furniture Row, man, we, we gave away so many races. We should have won a lot there in 2013. I just remember when you showed up with that furniture row cart in Michigan, and it looked like it was broken. Oh, we had it slammed to the ground, wow. man. We had it down low. Looking who, engineered, chart. who engineered that out? That was Cole Pern. Yeah. That that was, was, he's ahead of his time there, right? Yep. When Mr. Hendrick stops by and finds Barney Visser on pit road and says, you're winning the arms race. Yeah. I remember Barney. He was just glowing for, for <laughs> half a year after that. What? what uh, so, hang on. Let me finish. Let me finish. So, 2014 was uh, uh, Daniel Canost. Uh, 2015 with Tony Gibson, Klossmeyer in 16. And then um, with Billy Scott um, last year at Bristol. I think I got them all. And then now we've got 
Matt McCall. McCall. Yeah, he's a racer. Is that used, nine? To, used to drive. Did I leave cars. somebody out again? I don't know what y'all come up with. Sounds good. I'm, I'm so um, really good results. A lot of good teams. A lot of good people. Right on. Yeah. And and uh, it's it's been a heck of a ride. You mentioned our buddy Nick Harrison. Um, that passed Saturday night. We woke up with that that terrible news on Sunday morning. You drove to to Victory Lane with him in James's Xfinity car. You said you didn't win for for uh, James, but you did at the Xfinity level. Yeah. And I, I loved your tweet, and I want to I want to read it. Um, we all lost a friend last night. We love you, Nick Harrison. You're a leader and a great friend to all. Nick really helped me rebuild my career when I was at a low point. Uh, R.I.P. Nick, and, and a great picture of the victory in, in Daytona. Talk about that, the low point. And you had driven for Roush and, and Penske, and now you're looking at, you know, I'm going to drive for James. Am, am I on my way out? Uh, did you ever wonder what the future might hold after you left Penske and you wound up at James's? So that um, situation and everything that went down at Penske – I was up in arms with the performance of our cars, and we had finished 11th in points two years in a row, and there was no, like no concern of fixing the issues. I mean, we ran out of gas while leading at Phoenix in that November race. You know, we went to Homestead, and it was a, a battle with Boyer on basically a heads-up race. Whoever finishes in front of who is going to be 10th overall, and 10th kind of can salvage a year. It soothes things Sounds a bit. Sounds a hell of a lot better than 11th. 11th just sucks. The wrist pin on the drive shaft, exactly what happened to Bowman's car this weekend, mm. happened to mine on lap three of the race at Homestead. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't blow through the oil tank. It just shot the wrist pin out through the drive shaft tunnel into the car, hit the roof of the car. Like, it could have came through yeah. and hit my leg and... Now we're laps down, and I'm just pissed yeah. about everything that added up to that moment. And it's like, guys, it's, the cars are not where they need to be. And they're like, well, we don't think you're where you need to be. And I'm like, well, we're having this discussion, and there's no leaves on the trees. Like, it's December. This is getting really weird. And we both said, hell it, we're out. I, I went out on a journey. Because I was getting paid really well at Penske. Mm -hmm. We're winning races, but we're not in contention to win championships. And I said, screw it, I'm out. I'll go find a ride later. One of the first guys I called was Felix Sabatis. I talked to him. Um, you know, He said, hey, you might want to call James Finch. I called Richard Childress. Um, I went to drive to Level Cross, North Carolina. Met with Richard Petty sat in his offices about driving for him. And at the end of it, I chose my own therapy path. I said, you know, I was a young guy, 22 years old, and plopped into Roush, top-tier equipment right away. Everybody always says, man, if I knew now what I knew then, how good could I be? Did I say that right? It's like, I, I want to take this knowledge and start over. Wow. So you did know now what you didn't know then. I don't know if I know what I knew what I was even doing then. But you knew something was new, and you knew that you needed to be new. And it was definitely then to make now happen. That's profound. I actually turned down an offer from Richard Petty Motorsports. Richard wanted me to drive for him, and... Then that was when he went in the news to say Kurt was unsponsorable. I'm like, wait a minute, that didn't happen. <laughs> but, but I can't rebuke the king. Uh, and I, I wanted to go with James Finch. James Finch says, hey, you drive my car, we split the purse. I'm like, all right, handshake, done. Did you? Did you? That was going to cover my costs, and I was going to break even that year if we yeah, split the purse. Right. And away we went. Yeah. And so I, with, with that, I, I bought a Chevy truck. From City Chevrolet, from Rick Hendrick. It was a used truck out of the used truck department. I drove down to South Carolina three times a week. Went to Finch's shop, hung out with Nick Harrison, that whole gang, and did it old school. Went to the Peach Pit restaurant yeah. where Pearson would go. And anybody in South Carolina that was a racer, 
uh, Libby's. There's a bar down there that all the guys would go to <laughs> after five o'clock. And just did it old school and and put myself on a path to work my way back up. And that's what Phoenix Racing was about. And Nick Harrison believed in me. I believed in him. And we had some fun races together. How cool is it? Is it to listen to Nick talk about Sterling and the fun that they had? And and I know y'all have got some great stories. I'm just I'm thankful that that you're my guest today. Um, with the fact that we we lost a buddy over the weekend, and we can celebrate right now and and smile over. I wrote on my Twitter like Nick always made me smile, and and I just think that's a great thing to say about a person. Nick, Nick had that comedy relief but also the the old school no we're we're gonna be serious when we're working yes and five o'clock rolls around we're still gonna get our work done and then we'll go get a beer yeah but nick was like a chris farley just happy making jokes and and fun all the time and it made everybody else want to work that much harder around him talk about the knowledge that you brought to 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 Phoenix for James and you know you you've driven for a five car team that Jack Roush owned a, a four car team that that Roger had and and now you're going to and plus those guys you know they're they've been around racing forever and now James has been around racing forever but it's mostly late models and, and Xfinity uh, what what did you bring to 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 Nick and James and that team that made y'all so good I tried to be as uh, consistent as I could in the car and give the feedback like I normally like to give with the handling, but also just try to nurse the best finish out of the car. And so our goal was let's finish 18th each and every week. You know, we did 23rd, you know, scraping. Uh, we got 12th, I think, at Fontana. Uh, we might have led laps at Bristol, Sonoma. I want to talk about that. We almost sure. won there. Yeah, you about beat us. That's and when you're chasing yeah, Boyer down. I was chasing Boyer, and I started to feel the rear end falling. Yeah. I, I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on back there? And it, I'm like, man, if I move Boyer out of the way, and usually when you move somebody, that it's a pretty big moment. Like at Sonoma, you don't really save it. And if the rear end falls out, how how stupid was that? And but, I, I felt it like trying to fall out of the back. And I'm like, I just got to nurse this thing home. But you never, I mean, you didn't lose much ground with your nursing. I, I, Stuart got by me, and I was looking in the mirror for the rest of the game coming, but yeah. nursed it just enough to bring it home in third. And that setup we copied from Penske. I, I had it as best as I had it in my memory, mm-hmm. had some notes, and we copied it the best we could. I won the year before at Sonoma with that setup. We almost won again at Sonoma. Yeah. That- and there's certain tracks where – a trend can trump technology. Follow me, like the mile and a half and some of the short tracks, you have different things and approaches that you go about. But a road course, eh, it's kind of a trend. It's yes. like, what'd you run last year? Should right. work. And so it was really neat to almost win that race back to back. It sure was. Let's, let's, uh... but for Nick, he was a good dude and a great leader and will be missed by so many people. Yeah. Um, after Phoenix Racing, he went up to RCR. Spent some time up there, won races with Austin Dillon. And they were all in victory lane at Daytona with that big win for Ross and the one, yeah. two, three finish for Colleg Racing, uh, being able to get to victory lane just a week ago, and now yeah. he's gone. I know, it's sad. We, we lost a good friend way too early. Yeah. Well, it's been an interesting ride. Let's get another Twitter question. How about that, CJ? This is my assistant, CJ Kurt. Did you say hi to CJ? Uh, Handsome yeah, devil me, me over there. Kurt, yeah. Kurt hang out. Solid, I actually yeah. got to hang out on uh, Kurt's motorhome one time and play with his dogs. Nice. So yeah. Kurt's, Kurt's my favorite now because he has cute puppies. And that's Ford over there. He's our producer, director. Oh, yeah, he's on it. The camera guy. And then Spencer. Spencer, he, the camera guy. That's a, And this is our plush Fox Sports studio with uh, the trunk off my Bristol car I crashed. Nice. And the, the helmet's and in the here, one too, in the photo. from the Bristol car, right? Yeah, yep. that's my helmet from that race. And then Larry McReynolds, i got to keep my eye on him. Oh, he wants your Alabama helmet? <laughs> Comes by here and tries to get my Alabama helmet. Nice. But uh, how we about had, a question? Yeah, we had a good question come in from DJ Cummings, and he wants to know, since you talked about it in, uh, after the race in Kentucky, did you end up putting the Kentucky trophy on Kyle's kitchen counter at his house the next day? 
<laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I, I was I was full bore. I'm gonna just show up, Kyle, big time, right? And learning that he took off on the plane without me. That's gonna happen, though, right? Yeah. I mean, come on, bro. <laughs> I have a half hour worth of patience. And when I thought about it, the trophy was in the hauler after the race, and they were just like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna put it up in the shop. We're gonna have it for all the crew guys to take pictures." And I'm like, "Probably should just leave it with them." And then what really made me just decide to leave it, Kyle's got two Kentucky trophies. Yeah. My one wouldn't have added up, and you don't want your pony to lose a horse race. Like, when ponies lose horse races, they're just not as fast. Right. So I gave respect to the trophy and to my crew guys. Yeah. How'd you get home? I thumbed a ride with uh, Victory Air, nice. one of the last planes to leave with all a bunch of crew members from all different teams. Yes. We called, and uh, they had two seats, and they actually did one of the – the circles, the roundabouts before they took off. Right. Victory Vic- Circle. Victory Circle, yeah. That's awesome. Let's talk about your little brother for just a bit. Back in, was it 07 or 10 or 11, you won in his, um, what year was it? 12. Okay, let me his start His Xfinity over. car? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about your little brother for a minute. Um, I grew up as a little brother to a pretty famous racer. Um, in 012, you drove for Kyle in his Xfinity car. And what a dramatic victory. I don't think any other driver ever won for Kyle other than you. And what a dramatic win that was at Richmond that night when you battled Denny all the way to the checkered. That one was sweet. Um, you know, again, with Phoenix Racing on the cup side, and my little brother gave me a call. He said, hey, I got this sponsor, and if you come on over, they want both of us to drive the car every weekend. How, how'd that work out and for you? And so Monster Energy <laughs> – <laughs> just so happened to be that sponsor, and they were jazzed up. They're like, if we get both bushes yeah. to drive our car every other weekend, hell yeah, we're all in. And it was really neat to work with my little brother, uh, with Beam as the crew chief, and everybody at KBM. We had our work cut out for us. You know, we weren't the big Gibbs. Mm-hmm. You know, we weren't the big RCR. Penske. And, and Penske in the Xfinity Series. And we had an engine deal with Triad, uh, with Toyota. And we, we had to work hard to make it to make it happen and to get the speed. And Richmond was perfect. Uh, it's a track where you don't need the full horsepower. Uh, we uh, had the right pitch strategy. And then a late race caution. What went through my mind was a race that I lost at Richmond to Mark Martin in an IROC car. Wow. That's going back a bit. It flashed through my mind. I was faster than Mark, but he had me pinned down on the bottom. Uh-huh. And I couldn't get by because it kept breaking loose, and I couldn't get the traction to seal the pass. And so when Denny got to me, I just acted like I was just pulling over, like a Mark Martin move, gave him the inside, and then came down on him sharp in the corner and kept busting him loose Yeah. so he couldn't complete the pass. And so I held him off on the outside from an old finish that I remembered how I lost. Isn't that crazy, the, the data bank that you collect? And yours is uh, getting pretty full. <laughs> you showed up. There's in, still some room, but yeah. <laughs> you sure showed up in 2001. And, and think I, I have so much I want to talk about. Um, so you, you talked about getting that win for your little brother. Uh, I grew up in, in the shadow of my older brother. My career was building, and I was trying to get better and make it in NASCAR. And, and he was sort of at the peak. And then at some point, we sort of transitioned and you know I was running better and he went went to do TV um we never were we never raced hard together I guess uh and I have so much respect for him has there been times that with your little brother's success that you ever felt like you were in his shadow does that make sense yeah I think there was the the switch or a flip-flop so to speak of my success of being a champion early, I think it was his rookie year, 04. He might have been rookie in 05. I can't remember. That. I think it was 04. So there he is, rookie of the year, you know, getting all the pictures and everything right over next to Big Brother. Champ. Who's champion. And it, it all had a perfect timeline going. And the race wins that I had and the amount of years of experience, I knew it was going to take him a little bit to get caught up. 07, we wrecked each other at the All-Star Race. That was a fun moment. i got to tell you a quick story about that. Grandma had to jump in and settle that one out. But, yeah, what, what do you got? I got This is pretty funny. So 
I wasn't being a smart ass, I promise, but we are doing inside Winston Cup Racing or whatever it was called, you know, on, on Speed Channel. And so they come to me, you guys go down into turn one and, and you crash. Uh, he got loose, right, under you? Yeah. Yeah. That's Just what to I be remember. Clear. Oh, yeah. yeah, he definitely screwed up. <laughs> so listen to this. We're on the show Monday night, you know, and I'm, I like to have fun. And they came to me and they said, you know, Who's, whose fault was this, Mike? I said, looks like to me it was Mr. and Mrs. Bush's. <laughs> And and I guess people took that as like, well, they didn't discipline them or what. I meant they had y'all, you know, <laughs> they they're your they're the reason why you're on Earth. And so, whose else fault could it be? It was Got just bad parents. <laughs> so, so the funny part, a couple of weeks later, I'm standing on my bus at Michigan. I'll never forget this. And I'm in the door, and Benito, my my bus driver, he's there, and I'm like, what do you want for lunch? Blah blah blah. And your dad comes walking by. And he's like, yeah, you think you're a real cute son of a bitch, don't you? think you're something. You're, you're, you're funny, aren't you? My dad was barking at you? Yeah, yeah. he's walking by. He never stopped. He just barked, he yelled at me the whole way. And when he got gone, I said, Benito, who was that man that just cussed me out? I had no idea. <laughs> and he said, that's Mr. Bush. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, I think I... <laughs> connected the dots on that one. So I saw your ma a couple weeks later. I'm like, I didn't mean anything by that, but that was pretty funny. But yes, it's a tough job being a, a commentator. It is. You got to come up with some creative content, or yeah. you won't have a job. Yeah, to be a professional analyst and really dissect everything. Oh yeah, and you know this because Family you are be the first one to tell you. <laughs> you are an analyst now. You work for Fox. We had some fun in the booth together. Yeah, it's it's a whole different game when you have. Sometimes it's people's livelihood on the line on if if they made a mistake or their sponsors are in or out and if you call it the right way or yeah. the wrong way well, and i was talking up one kid at at pocono during the race and then he spun out on me i was like oh man i was trying <laughs> to talk him up i talked uh i talked brandon up to, jones yeah brandon uh, i talked up the racing action we would see at uh, chicago i think i'm like these guys are gonna be two three four wide it's gonna be crazy they threw the green flag and uh sheldon creed started on the pole drove off and left everybody not one damn caution. I'm like, so they started the second stage. You tried to sell it in there. And they started wrecking. I was like, see, I told you they was going to wreck. There it was. <laughs> so the, 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 the wreck and the all-star race. Yeah, with my little brother. Yeah. Little, how, how did that affect y'all's relationships? That's something you just, like, I wrecked my brother once, and we just said, I, I said, I screwed up. My fault. And we moved on. How was that conversation after that crash? It, it wasn't good. Um, in all honesty, he, he starts chirping that it was my fault, and then it got into other things uh, that, you know, my image in the sport gave him a, a bad foot to stand on when he came in, you know, with my different run-ins with different drivers, which there was one, Jimmy Spencer. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, bro, I, it's, it's fine. Just chill out. We're going to be okay. And he was still in the on the gas mode. You know how when drivers come in and there's no patience level and – you're not able to absorb the things around you. And so he was on the gas hard. Then the best worst case scenario, the car tomorrow, mm -hmm. 2008. He won like eight races that year with Addington. You know, should have won the championship. And that was the switch over for us. It literally happened over a decade ago with that car tomorrow because at Penske, dude, we were fumbling around running 16th, 18th. And it was a tough, tough 2008 so then we had to rebuild at penske to get our car tomorrow right but meanwhile that's that's the beginning for for kyle to mm -hmm. just this track this win this moment and i and, I, and i'm sitting there going ah i was agitated that i didn't have the car of tomorrow scienced out and mm -hmm. we weren't where we needed to be and then 2012 happened and it was the right timing for us to race together, to be together at Kyle Busch Motorsports, yeah. and to win that race, and the monster sponsorship to kind of kick things off, and and then it kind of turned sideways a little bit after that, you know, with with the way that Monster was wanting to hang Go out, forward. hang out with me a little <laughs> bit more so than than Kyle, and and yet so then we got through that path, and right. I'd say right now our relationship's been the best that it's ever been, uh, with age, with accomplishments satisfaction with life and it, it it takes that time kyle and i are seven years apart mm -hmm. and a lot of people forget about that yeah. you know i'm at different fan events or 
different speaking engagements. And when I tell people that we're seven years apart, they're, they're just, people are floored by that. Because they're all asking, hey, did you recommend your, your BMX bike? You know, did you recommend the go-karts? Yeah, it was different. They know I'm a little older, but right. nah, seven years apart, I'm I'm running truck series, and he's just getting established in legend cars. Yeah. When you elected to go mm-hmm. drive for Chip, was there ever a moment where you thought, I might just do TV? I think, I think I'd think i be fun. Or were you going to race something in 2019, no matter what? I had a, a really good commitment from Monster. They're like, man, we love your racing. We love your your brand, Aura. And what you help us do at the tracks with our distributors, our wholesalers, the fans. And I told them, because they told me, they're like, you can only really race for Stuart Haas, Gibbs, or Hendrick. That's that's who Monster, want, they want to stay with, a top-tier team. Mm-hmm. And I told them, I said, follow me. I got a plan. We're going to make that one car a winner. And it's that much more gratifying to yeah. know that I was taking a step beyond my normal capacity of getting that program to be a winning program. And now I want to take the next step. I want to make these guys championship Champions. contenders. Talk about your teammate, Kyle Larson. Over the last five years, I would bet that if you did one of those polls where you said check the most talented racer on the track, your brother certainly would have been up there. Kyle Larson, I think, might have won that ballot. People just appreciate the way he goes, runs the World of Outlaws cars. He, he's fast in the in the cup cars. What was your thinking when you went to Chip Ganassi Racing uh, about Kyle Larson, and what have you learned about him since then? Uh, my thinking was there's no reason to second-guess the teammate over there. I mean, Larson is a true talent, and he's uh, a champion in the making, and I believe he has all the right tools to make it happen. And so that's where here I come in as a 40 year old working with a a mid twenties kid. He's going to teach me things. I I wanted to have that happen for myself. And also I wanted to give to him Mm -hmm. some of the things that I think he's been missing of piecing all the puzzle pieces together. Right. Let's just, let's face it. Larson's a raw talent and the car's right. He's going to win it. And if it's not right, he'll still find a way to win it. But there's patterns in certain races, certain tracks, and certain things that I'm hopeful to help his knowledge and, and to get him more comfortable to make him the all-around racer that he can be in the Cup Series. You know, when I think of you, you're, you're analytical. You, you dig into your car. And you want to tell people exactly what it's doing here and there and, and, and what degree of wheel you're putting it in and, and what you could do to get that left front. But when I think of Larson, I, I, I don't even think of I know him. I mean, we golfed together. I'm like, what What was your setup like? Oh, I don't know. It, it just didn't handle right. Yeah, it was loose. It is, was that, yeah. is that a fair, like, you guys, which when you have diversely different approaches and both have success, you can you can and truly build off each other, I would guess. And, and that's where I've learned to kind of just chill sometimes, too, and let the talent of the people, the crew chief, the lead engineer, and the people that are on the one car do their job. Because that's the way Larson has had success with letting the 42 guys mm-hmm. do their thing. and But, yet I still want to just keep sprinkling in the way I've done things in the past and, you know, to get those wins and to get that comfort level of consistency. Right. That, that's the key thing, and that's where I'm hopeful that, that it all plays out in the right way and we're as strong as we can be when the playoffs start in, a, in what, six, seven weeks. Wow. Seems like it's just around the corner, and it's real cool to see the momentum of your, your one team. What do you got there, CJ? One more Twitter question for Kurt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we have one come in from uh, user handle Prince Philip. Forsberg Scores is the handle on that. He says, hey, Kurt, I know you're a big Golden Knights NHL fan. What's it like being around that hockey atmosphere as another professional athlete? That's great. I love the question, and, and, and I'm, I'm like a sports guy all the way around. You know, whether it's football, basketball, big baseball f- nut, fanatic for the Chicago Cubs. And from my hometown of Las Vegas to have an NHL team, a pro team, and then the Golden Knights, and then with the, the, the tragic shooting that happened on 1 October yeah. and the way the city rallied around that through sport, I love his question because I get pumped up. I love going to the to the live games at uh, the T-Mobile Arena and feeling the energy 
from my hometown people. That what are, about that horn? Oh yeah, that, I mean, I was all you, up you, on you've it. You've done it better than any. Your your horn was like Larry McReynolds driver starts your engines thing. McReynolds was epic. Mine, the, my mentality was, what would Gronk do? What would Gronkowski do? So I just went after it. Yeah, I almost broke it, but you know, it was fun. I mean, the, the energy and the atmosphere around Vegas, anytime, no matter if you're there for a sport or a NASCAR race, uh, you know, the strip and everything that's going on, there's always big excitement there. And that, that's just uh, it's who I am. It's who that city is. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, they're having a, a successful run like they are. Speaking of Vegas, we, uh, you and I, a few years back with our Monster Energy friends at the Hard Rock Hotel, I gave a, a speech about my book that I wrote uh, for all the, all the uh, Monster Energy salesmen and reps and... Like, it was really cool that you were there um, to, to, to hear my story. And another thing that was really cool, there's, like, big, burly guys with beards that came up to me after that speech and said, man, you made me cry. That, that's a, quite a story you got there. And the the Monster folks, Mitch Covington and, and um, the, the, the guys at Monster, they have commissioned my book to be a, a documentary, a movie. And that's going to come out here in a couple of months. And and I know you've seen the movie, and and I just wanted to let you know that that your emotion in Vegas and telling me how much you appreciated that story it meant the world to me. It's it's a very powerful piece. If I could tell it, anybody and everybody about it just for a few quick moments, when you were on stage, and this is all of the national salespeople. This is three four hundred monster executives from all over. And they're there coaching the sales staff on how the brand is going to look and how our approach needs to go and who you are when you're representing the brand is the same as if you're just walking into the convenience store to drop off a case mm-hmm. of Monster, right? And you're up on stage, and I'm sitting there with Rodney Sachs, the CEO, and everybody were, were, were ready to be entertained, right? Because that's... That's what I thought. Like, Mikey's going to go do a stand-up. Crazy Mikey. Yeah, he's going to go do stand-up. <laughs> this is going to be great. I'm like, Mikey's got this. And as you started, this this story starts to unravel, and I know where you're going. And yet you were – part of your delivery, I think, was to create this shakiness in the beginning and some of this lack of confidence. And as you start to roll with it, I'm sitting there, oh, man, Mikey's sideways, man. Somebody's got to go save him. And just as I'm starting to settle back in, you're, you grab a gear. You knew exactly what your delivery was. And you have got this room's attention now of a story of everything that you had been through, the highs, the lows, and this documentary you're talking about. It's called The Blink of an Eye. It truly is one of those historical, powerful NASCAR stories that fit up there in the top with everybody else. And your message at the end of it. Of all of the race losses, in, in even the Daytona 500 win, on who you are as a person and all the struggles that you've been through, it painted this picture that made everybody in that room feel like they were empowered to go and climb the Empire State Building yeah. with no regret and no remorse and no thought. They wanted to go and conquer something after that. And that's how I left that room. And now it's a documentary, you know, it's, and it's part of Monster's heritage. Mm-hmm. of coaching a lot of our young employees and people that come into the system. Well, I appreciate those kind words. It was a story that was hard to tell, but I wanted to tell it to inspire people and to try to make people understand that it doesn't matter doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down as long as you get back up. And, and uh, You did an amazing job. Well, thank you for but that. But that's the story. Yeah. It's been tough, but, yeah. you know, look at it. It's great where you are now. That was 2001 when that tragic day occurred in Daytona. Uh, think about some of the guys that came to NASCAR along that time. You and Kevin raced for Rookie of the Year in 01, I think. Yes. And then uh, Jimmy Johnson and Newman. Newman, both 02. 02 uh, Biffle, 03. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it crazy the, the, the years have gone by? And I'm sitting here talking to a 40-year-old Kurt Busch, and, and those guys are still out there contending for wins. And winning, it's, you and Kurt, you and Kevin, back to back, showed up in 0, 01, and 01. now you've won in two thousand nineteen. And that nuts? It, it is. It's it's been an amazing ride, you know, with great teams and great people and the competitors in our era, 
I think it's too early to say it, but I think when we look back on different eras and, and champions and the win columns, this uh, this 2000s group of drivers, I think it, you know, Jeff Gordon started a new trend for all young drivers to have an opportunity, right? And his rookie year was 93, 94. And then like when Tony Stewart came from IndyCar in 99, that started to change the yeah. way that, that drivers a, were like first choice draft picks. When I was a kid, you couldn't guy. get a guy, my guy. You couldn't get in a good car. You had to run the Bush series. Yeah, you know, there weren't Junior Johnson wasn't going to put some kid like Jeff Gordon in his car. Jeff Gordon changed the game for he, sure. He did, and it, it opened up the doors for a ton of us to have an opportunity at a young age. So you're you're a happily married man. Um, you got a great ride. You're winning races. Your your wife, she's a polo player. Are you a polo player? Do y'all do that together? How's that work? I, I'll go put around in first gear. <laughs> you get on a horse? I'll like, get on the horse. Those things make me nervous. They're so big. We went on a trail ride with a few of our friends one time, and it's about three quarters of the way through, and it's like the horses know where the barn is. No doubt. And it's... they were in a hurry to get back to the barn. It's in fourth gear, and I'm clamping on tighter with my ankles. Well, apparently that makes it grab fifth gear. <laughs> And I'm trying to pull back. How about I'm some to, information? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So that was really the last trail ride. But she plays polo at an extreme level yeah. and plays with the boys. Like, she's out there, elbows out. There's way more contact in polo than I thought there would be. And I couldn't be more proud of her. Does it make you nervous? She knows her stuff. Yeah. It's like her trusting me in the car, making good decisions. I, I trust her out on the polo field. And when she rides – she rides like an angel. She's she's so elegant, so Beautiful. pretty, and it's like a, a piece of art. And she got to play with Prince Harry a couple times. It, she knows her stuff, and I'm that's, very proud of her. That's awesome. I'll tell you the opposite of that. I was at Dale's <laughs> shop one day, and it was back when he had the shop behind his house. And and so Dale inspired me in so many different ways. But he said, let's go ride the fence. And he's a farmer, and I'm a kid from I'm a city boy from Kentucky. I'm like, all right, let's go ride the fence. What what's that mean? Yeah. And he said, well, we're gonna get a horse. We're gonna get on horses, and we're gonna go ride the perimeter of the property. He said, sometimes a tree will fall down. Get on the fence. Got to make sure it's all okay. So all right, let's ride the fence. So Buffy was with me, and it was me and Dale and Buffy, just the three of us, and we all get on these horses. And Dale Jr.'s there. This is like '99, probably 2000. Dale Jr.'s there working on his his car in the in the deer head shop, his late model or whatever he was driving. Jeff Green was there. He was driving Dale's bush car at the time. And we go walking. I'm I'm not I'm not liking this horse. It's, it's it seems antsy to me. It, it ain't liking you either. No, and it, it's not like because I'm fat, you know. And, and <laughs> no. one of them choose got one of them. One of the horses got Buffy, which would you know. That'd be a nice ride, huh? A horse is happy. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's a good one to have on you. The other one's got Dale, and he'll kill the horse if it don't act right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then here my big ass is riding on my horse. And we go by the shop, and, you know, I see Jeff Green. We're, we went to high school together. Uh, I wave at him. Hey, Dale. And, and we get down to the bottom of the hill, and we make a right. And as I expected, my horse was had an issue. And it reared up. And when it reared up, like, I looked for an exit. You know, I just said, I'm, I'm bail, I'm diving off. And so I dove off into the ditch and didn't get hurt. And I was so thankful. And they're laughing at me and Jeff Green and, and Dale said, you know, we saw y'all ride up one, ride out one second. And about a minute later, here comes a horse running back without anybody on it. And they said, I bet that's Michael's horse. <laughs> <laughs> so me trying to ride a horse didn't, I don't like that. So I, I, I commend you for getting on them with your I'll wife. I'll put around in first gear. I'll keep it at that. Well, this has been the best. Thank you for your time. Thank yeah, this you. This was fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And this, I mean, so many stories. There's only yeah. so much time, and we're gonna call back up again one time. I, I loved every minute of it. It's like that night when we were uh, in L.A. and you said, "Follow me. I know a good place to eat dinner." And uh, we hadn't really ever. That was like oh ten or eleven, maybe. We yeah. Really hung it out. was like a we were on a flight delay, right? Yes. It's like let's go. Yeah. Yeah. So we went and got a steak dinner and had a good time, and that. That, I think, put some of the, like, the racing friction behind us, and it was like, oh, yeah, there's the human element, and that's what helped us. Well, I appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, Thank buddy. you so much. Yes, sir. That's fun. I told you that was going to be fun, and certainly it was. So many great stories from NASCAR champion and Monster Energy race car driver, Kurt Busch. He's such an interesting character and a guy that 
I love seeing down in the garage area. So you can go to our Twitter page and send those questions in, NASCAR on Fox. Kurt certainly enjoyed your questions. You can also go to Instagram. We'll show you some videos and some stories there. Or the Fox Sports YouTube channel and watch a video of today's event. Man, so happy, so thankful you tuned in. Can't wait to see what next week brings. Mm -hmm.